Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Shure Jo. I'm an assistant professor in the University of Toronto. Today, I'm going to present our work on understanding the sustainability challenges for building open source scientific software. I'm sure that most of the audiences today are familiar with the importance of open source and are aware of the sustainability and support challenges in open source communities. In this project, we are focusing on a special type of open source community that is open source scientific so software. Um, scientific software development refers to the development processes for software that is used in a scientific discipline, such as biology, physics, chemistry, or even computing. However, in a scientific community, their participants are not just software developers, but also domain-specific um, experts. So in this graph, I'm showing you the Python-based scientific software ecosystem. On the right hand, these are some biocomputing related Java-based open source scientific software. These are essential tools for researchers and their importance will only continue to grow as scientific inquiry becomes increasingly reliant on computational methods. In this talk, I'm gonna show you that the risks you know of in open source communities in general, the maintenance and the community health, these are exaggerated in the scientific open source communities. If you lose either of the domain experts or the software professionalism, the project can threaten to fall apart and it is uh, actually two fronted risk they are facing. And because these two groups has, uh, have different training and education background and incentives, there are tension and uh, conflicts between them and make the sustainability even more challenging. So previously researchers investigated the interdisciplinary collaboration phenomenon when building AI-based software, where software engineers need to collaborate with data science experts along the machine learning life cycle. Specifically, data scientists uh, often focus on the early stage of the life cycle, uh, aiming for a high-performed machine learning model, and software developers uh, tend to focus on integrating the model into a larger system and assure the performance of the whole system. This is another view to show that when building AI-based software system, people have different focuses um, during the development procedure. And of course, there are some uh, collaboration points and the study found that the interdisciplinary collaboration creates a lot of different tensions in the process. So in our study, we are focusing on interdisciplinary collaboration when building scientific software in the open source environment. Related work found that the majority of development work is done by scientists themselves and professional developers may be employed later to create and maintain a software. Different from the well-defined machine learning lifecycle, it is unclear how the two groups were collaborating with each other in open source environment and how such collaboration will affect the sustainability challenges. Specifically, we investigate this problem from two aspects. First, we focus on the science-related challenges in open source context by asking what are the major obstacles when an interdisciplinary team builds and maintains the scientific software in open source? And next, we focus on the open source related challenges in scientific community by asking what are the main factors for sustaining the scientific open source community. So in order to answer these, we did a case study using these methodologies on a, uh, on a scientific software in physics domain. For research ethics concerns, we anonymized the real project name and used the fake name MoonPy to refer to the project. So MoonPy, as you can see from here, is a big enough and long enough lived project. Now let's look at the result. First, we investigate the science-related challenges in open source context. We would like to understand how our scientists collaborate with software engineers. How do they split the task? We had a hypothesis that software engineers would work more on the infrastructure operation of the system, while scientists would work more on the domain-specific code. For this part, we focus on the core developers over the 10 years, and we detect the type of their contribution by analyzing the commit history. And we divide the code into two categories. One is infrastructure, another one is domain-specific. So for each core contributor, we calculate the number of merge commits, and then we plot their contribution on the spectrum. And the size of the dot is about the number of commits. The left extreme are the 100% infrastructure-related contribution, while the right extreme are 100% domain-specific code contribution. As you can see, there are people at all parts of that spectrum. 
Also, there are actually only two professional software engineers among all the 40 core developers or core contributors, and the others are all professional scientists. There is someone at both that has both expertise in software engineering and science, but this person in the middle is very much an exception in a, uh, to the project. It is rare in this MoonPy community that people have both backgrounds. It is not surprising that this person does not have an, has an easy life, and they had a lot of difficult conversation with people on the extreme of the spectrum. And more interestingly, uh, from our interview study, we observed that there is a tension between the two groups of experts. It's not about their titles, but the mindsets. For example, we observed that people who view the best practices of maintenance and software upgrade as the value that bring into the software, and people who are looking at the domain utility and science-related value of the project. And another um, example is about the task prioritization between the two groups. On the one hand, software engineers believe it is important to follow software engineering best practices and utilize automated workflows such as CI/CD to ensure the code quality and reduce the maintenance burden. As a result, they often need to explain to scientists that their code does not meet the code quality standard and need more refactoring. On the other hand, scientists perceive software engineers as someone that hold this rigid standards that they want to adhere to or who are not as familiar with the kind of flexibility nature of scientific software development. Yeah. And another tension revealed in the interview is the perception of seniority in the Mumbai community. According to the interviewees, one distinction between the scientific software community and the traditional open source community is the ranking of seniority. As in traditional open source uh, projects, the contributors are ranked by the volume of their code contribution. While in MoonPy, people with a senior academic title have more decision-making power on whether to merge this PR or not. So these are fundamentally in tension from each other. And the second part of our study focuses on the other side of the scenario, which is uh, the sustainability challenges in the open source communities with the science context. Specifically, we identified the contributors who merge code before, but has no activity in the past 100 days in this MoonPy project, and ask three questions. Like, what was the incentive that you contribute to MoonPy? What was the reason you left the community? And um, do you have any suggestions of improving the uh, sustainability? So we summarized the results of incentives and reasons of disengagement using the Sankey diagram. As you can see, the majority of people that contributed to MoonPy due to their own usage, and they left because the project is stable or their focus has shifted. So you might think, yeah, these are pretty obvious reasons. So what can we do as a maintainer to keep them stay longer? Unfortunately, there is not a law that is actually avoidable. The question you might have as a maintainer is, what can I do with this information then, right? So from our study, we identified a few opportunities. If the goal is not the long-term participation of one member, but the overall health of the community, we need a different strategy. We have received many valuable suggestions and opinions, but given the time limitation, I would like to present two major ones. The first one, we should acknowledge that there is a lot about the turnover processes that we cannot change. But we can, what we can change is to actually make the project more accessible. Knowing that we are not only need to make the project accessible, but we need to make the science accessible at the same time. Therefore, when we provide documentation, we not only need to document the source code, but also need to explain the scientific theory behind that. Similarly, prior uh, previous work already showed that um, providing this good first issue is a great strategy to attract newcomers. But many of our participants suggested that to fix a good issue needs they need to not only understand the code or what the issue is, but also need to provide guidance on the corresponding code module and the theory that contributor needs to understand before really make this contribution. In this way, it turns the project into not being just a software participation exercise in a domain-specific tool, but also a valuable learning exercise for us, for someone who is taking something from these experiences. Then as a software engineer researcher, an open question rises naturally for us is, can we design some tools to automate this documentation processes that connect both code and theory? 
And the second strategy I would like to share is to recognize the participation and contribution. First, if you're using any of the open source scientific software or packages, please consider citing the work in the project of the project in your paper or report um, to give people the recognition of participation and contribution in the project. And some survey participants would like to know the impact of their contribution, such as how many researchers are using their code, how many PhD students are using uh, my code to contribute to their thesis, right? So then the question for us again is, can we design better ways to quantify the impact beyond just the number of downloads? Can we detect the usage of their code in a small, a finer granularity in a larger scale? So there are many other insights I don't have time to share, but if you're interested, I will be more than happy to discuss offline. Last but not least, I would like to thank my students and collaborators who have been contributing to this work. To summarize, in this project, we investigate a unique open source scientific software, and the results show that the sustainability challenges in open source in general will get worse when you are building a scientific package. To improve the uh, sustainability in this context, we need to recognize the tension between the two groups of experts, be aware of um, that these will be exaggerated challenges, and given that software developers are not fungible, but neither are scientists. And we definitely need different strategies. If you're in a leadership role in a scientific open source community, the efforts need to be put into improving the accessibility uh, of the project by lowering the barrier for both code, software engineering, and the science and the theory. And if you are um, a user of these tools, please consider um, give recognition of these tools and giving um, um, acknowledgement of these contributions. That concludes my talk. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, again, really interesting. I learned late, later in life, like in the recent years, that this was the type of research I was doing as an undergrad, doing mm -hmm. helping develop technology for uh, geologists and the software they use to maintain their data. So I think this is a really interesting and apparently understudied space. I wonder, the work that you've been doing here, is that building off of any other work specific to the sustainability piece or even the interactions that happens, it seems like that's part of the problem and solution is how do we how do we make these interactions meaningful for both parties such that we're getting these outcomes as well as, again, them being sustainable. Um, is this built on things or is this really kind of some of the first work to look at those interactions? Um. Uh, so prior uh, previous work have already been looking into this uh, building scientific software in a small institute or kind of a local institute instead of this distributed collaboration. So uh, I think um, previous work have also looked into like open source scientific software, but not on GitHub, but some um, repositories, they publish their source code. So they look yeah. into the different roles in terms of the seniority of like whether it's a professor or, uh, or uh, students. But here right. we actually try to split them into uh, their background or roles or mindset. Right. I think that's kind of a new aspect that we bring into. Yeah. Yep. And it seems important with respect to it sounds like how they're thinking about the, the end result, the product that that's being developed and used. Fantastic. <laughs> so I see we have another question uh, that we do have one minute for. Uh, Greg wants to know where and how do scientists learn what they know about programming? Are they learning it in class? Are they learning it from other researchers on the job? YouTube? Uh, how, do, do you have any insights on that? Yeah, so among all the of uh, the de uh, developers or core developers that we uh, talked with, actually most of them uh, learned just self self taught um, uh, software developers, and if never have taken any courses, they don't have a degree in a discipline. Uh, only one of the professional software engineers that we interviewed, like I showed two of them, uh, yeah. one. Um, uh, they had a, a computer science background in their undergrad. So um, actually, most of the scientists, they are not trained with professional software engineering background. But the problem is we cannot just blame them of they have not no software engineering background right. because sometimes the software engineering practices cannot be directly applied to build this scientific software. So we actually need to adjust the software uh, engineering best practices to build this domain-specific software. 100%. 